So just a reminder for us, uh, panel three uh, is talking about symptoms of early infantile and then on the other age end of the spectrum, adult forms of NPC and impact on daily life. So again, we'll have our speakers begin, self-introduce, have comments for about four minutes and move ahead. So that just all okay. for you, thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Debbie Kaflowitz. I'm from New Providence, New Jersey. My first thought was that Rachel should be telling this story. Unfortunately, our only child, Rachel, passed away about five months ago. So I'm going to try to speak as if I were Rachel. My name is Rachel, and I, am forever, I will forever be 33. My biggest dreams were to be a teacher like my mom and to start a family. However, before I could accomplish any of my dreams, my life fell apart. I had always struggled in school, but in my junior year of high school, my thoughts and emotions became frightening to me. I cried all the time. I thought bad people were after us, so I lived in constant fear, even in my own home. Doctors used the words bipolar, psychotic, and schizoaffective. Medication didn't keep me stable. Between the ages of 18 and 23, I was hospitalized four different times in psychiatric units. But each time, even after eight weeks at New York Presbyterian, the doctors just shook their heads and sent me home. Excuse me. I didn't have any friends and felt so lonely. My parents always looked worried and stopped leaving the house. I apologized for ruining their lives. They reassured me but I knew it was my fault. I thought my life was getting back on track when I turned 24. The medicine was actually working. However, my cognitive ability started to decline. I couldn't grasp higher level thinking. I had no sense of time. I could no longer read or understand the content, and I couldn't carry out instructions given to me five minutes before. I went to my grandfather's funeral, and a week later, I didn't remember it. My mom asked the doctor if young adults could have Alzheimer's. This clearly wasn't just emotional. In October 2012, at age 26, I was diagnosed with the devastating disease, Neiman Pick type C. Within two years of the diagnosis, I went from walking fine, to an awkward gait, to falling often, to a walker, and soon after that, a wheelchair. I actually felt relieved with the wheelchair, but also scared because I could no longer get anywhere myself. I used to dance, play volleyball, drive. Now I couldn't walk. What was happening? I was having problems swallowing. My list of safe foods got smaller and smaller until it consisted of pasta, tuna salad, and egg salad. Eating outside our home was very difficult. All liquids had to be thickened with a special gel. We took it everywhere we went. Just to be safe, we kept extra packets in my pocketbook and mom's, mom and dad's car, and my day programs. My hands started to tremble. Those tremors got worse and worse until I couldn't hold anything. Eventually, I couldn't even feed myself. That was embarrassing. All these limitations made my world smaller and smaller. Going out to eat was more challenging than fun. I couldn't go to the movies because I couldn't keep my head raised to see the screen, and my brain didn't understand the story anyway. I couldn't make the jewelry I used to create and sell. I went from doing it myself to having someone else be my hands while I told them what to do. Even that was difficult because although my speech was clear, I couldn't organize my thoughts to explain things well. I was completely dependent on other people for every part of daily life, getting dressed, brushing my teeth, everything. My peers' lives had moved forward. Mine was moving backwards. I kept getting weaker and got tired easily. On September 8, 2018, at age 33, I was admitted to the hospital with a high fever due from para-influenza. Then came pneumonia. After two months, I couldn't fight anymore. My parents had to make the most horrible decision ever, move me to hospice. It was the right decision. 
I am at peace. Thank you. My name is Michelle Miller, and my son Parker has Neiman Pick, and we live with my husband Dane and uh, Parker's older brother Roman in Mesa, Arizona. Our Parker is a child that smiles all the time and is full of energy. He is currently two years old and loves dinosaurs, and he wants to do everything his brother does, even if that means to stir up trouble. We have been fortunate that he has not shown any neurological symptoms related to Neiman Pick as of right now. Parker was born on time, but within one month of life, his belly became significantly distended and he struggled to breastfeed. He was slightly jaundiced, but we were told it was likely breast milk jaundice because ultrasound results came back normal. Over the next couple of months, as we watched him grow, Dane and I became more worried because his stomach remained large, he seemed to have more GI symptoms, and it almost seemed to hurt him to breathe. We took him to a GI specialist at four months of age and was told that he had a large liver and spleen, which was a shock to us. Parker was hospitalized for four days so he could undergo a full workup of medical tests, including a liver biopsy. Everything fell apart for our family a month later when his hepatologist told us Parker would need a liver transplant, and we found out that all of his liver issues were due to Neiman Pick type C. After speaking with several of his doctors, we chose to pursue an experimental IV infusion for Parker since it was not guaranteed that he would even be able to receive a liver since NPC is such a severe neurological disease. At seven months old, Parker had a chest port implanted that allowed him to receive infusions every two weeks, and this IV medication has improved his liver immensely and made it so that both the size of his liver and spleen has decreased to almost normal. Although his infusions are helping, he cries and runs away as soon as he sees me get out the tube of lidocaine cream because he knows what's coming. On his infusion days, the nursing staff just adore him and they shower him with more attention than really anyone deserves. But he still dreads and remembers what comes each time we go to the hospital. On these days, we are at the hospital for 10 hours and this really wears on Parker as well as my husband and I. He is disappointed that he does not get to play with Roro, which he refers to Roman as, um, because he idolizes his, his brother, and that's his favorite person to play with. I look back at Parker's baby pictures and see how sick he really looked. It is hard to comprehend that this is the same child based on how well he is thriving right now. NPC is a horrific disease, and my husband and I remain vigilant as we wait for any neurological symptom to appear, which is inevitable. I worry about how I'm going to answer him when he asks why he can't do the same things that Roman and his friends can do. We are hopeful that treatments become available that not only prolong his life for us, but also that allow a good quality of life for him. We want him to be able to fully embrace his childhood, even though it's guaranteed he's going to have to make sacrifices. Neiman Pick Type C is rare, genetic, and fatal. There's no cure or approved treatment and it comes with a heartbreaking nickname, Childhood Alzheimer's. It's the nightmare you wouldn't dare dream of, yet some of us wake up to each morning. Words don't do justice to all that NPC is and does to everyone here or to our family and friends in small town Alabama. I'm Kayla Miller, and I'm here to be the voice of my seven-year-old hero, my daughter Cameron, who lives with NPC. NPC has been a part of our lives since Cameron was diagnosed at four months old due to an enlarged spleen and liver. Our seemingly healthy baby began to show symptoms at two. 
by four, just before beginning treatments, the disease quickly escalated. While some aspects have improved, there are things we won't ever get back. Yet we stay positive. I wish I could show, only show you life through Cameron's rose-colored glasses, but I know that's not the intention of this speech. So with that being said, NPC shows no mercy. It will eventually steal from the six-month-old who wowed the NIH with her ability to identify and say dot. It will allow you to watch a baby who started walking at nine months old change into a three-year-old who can run her great-grandparents' long and winding driveway. Then by four, it will cause fatigue, dystonia, and cramping. It will take away the ability to slide, hop, and flip. And it will cause tremors and make it hard to hold a pencil or turn a candy machine knob. NPC will blur the speech of the child who once strummed a guitar as she sang, Jesus Loves Me. It will bring the need for hearing aids as it has turned the sound of birds into a fleeting memory and speech into muffled noises. NPC will steal joy from laughter as you fall from cataplexy. It will take a one-year-old who is potty trained and cause her incontinence by the age of five. Then it will bring up old memories and cause embarrassment and confusion. By seven, you'll need assistance from loved ones, friends, teachers, braces, a walker, or a wheelchair. Hair brushing, bathing, dressing, and other needs will be a task you can't face alone, and you'll need constant care. NPC will make your speech understandable at times, and at other times you'll stammer and point in frustration, or rub your belly and say yum as you try to express your needs. It will turn your favorite gummies and juice into a choking hazard and cause meals that need to be monitored. It will bring more pneumonias than most see in a lifetime and will intensify the flu into a terrifying stay in the pulmonary intensive care unit. NPC will pull you out of days, I'm sorry, will pull you out of school for days or weeks at a time and you'll miss many memories with friends. Yet you'll enjoy art by painting lines and shapes and drawing dot dot smileys with your aide Miss Amanda. It will cause you to ask others if they remember things because you're unsure yourself and have been prompted to remember too many times. And though you once knew your shapes, colors, numbers, and letters, you'll eventually hold on to spelling your name, K-A-M. NPC will take away your ability to remember your transfer school bus friends who you've come to know for three years. On your best days, you won't be able to remember most of your friends' names. And on your worst days, NPC will keep you from remem remembering the name of family and close friends. It will take more than just quantity of life. Eventually, it will take the quality too. As a parent, it will cause you to view time differently. It will make you face your biggest fears of lo losing your child's personality and quality of life along the way. Some people come into your life and change it in such a novel way that you don't remember what life was like before them. Cameron is that person for me. Thank you for this opportunity, and thank you for supporting our efforts to find a cure for NPC and a cure for Cameron. Hello. Hi, I'm uh, Shannon from Rhode Island, and uh, the handsome gentleman to the right of your screen is my oldest son, Cameron. He does not have NPC, and the little guy is my youngest son. His name is Chase, and he retired from his battle with Neiman Pick Type C on December 1, 2016, at seven years, three months, and 10 days old. So his official diagnosis came the day he turned 25 months old. Um, his diagnostic journey parallels most other families here. In utero, I was certain something was wrong. Um, I'm high risk, being a type 1 diabetic, was very closely watched. Uh, we did basic genetic testing, uh, but we didn't do amnio to look for any rare genetic abnormalities. Everything looked normal, but my unease persisted. My son's life was remarkable, and he brought many people a lot of joy. I'm just not sure I would have let him suffer through it if I knew what he was in for. Chase's life was his illness. He was born with a catch-all diagnosis of cholestatic liver disease and an enlarged spleen. He suffered blood work every few days for the first six weeks of his life. Uh, we were living in Florida at the time, and we couldn't rule out biliary atresia, so he had to fly to Cincinnati at 10 weeks old uh, to consider doing a procedure called a Kasai. He didn't need it. Uh, they ran a full genetic panel on him at that time, but nobody tested for NPC. 
So he was labeled failure to thrive. Uh, specialized formula was needed. He had low muscle tone. And his eyes even seemed off. And later we learned uh, what I was describing was supranuclear supra gaze palsy. Um, and we moved for what would have been uh, the second of four states in three years to seek answers in treatment. A pediatrician in Vermont stepped in and she got him tested for MPC. And at the same time, hooked us up with every conceivable support service. He had PT, OT, speech, hydrotherapy from about 18 months on. When we saw a dietitian for him and we were putting butter on his butter, but he remained very underweight. We added a drug for glycosphingolipidosis within two weeks of his formal NPC diagnosis. And within four months, uh, we were fortunate enough to get him on compassionate IV use of a compound. And it was at that time he finally began to add language, walked assisted, laughed, and for the first time, he made some decisions for himself. A series of events led to a clinical hold on his compassionate IV compound trial. Um, and it was ultimately lifted. However, he was off this compound for eight months. And when you have such aggressive mutations, it meant his disease was uh, very quickly able to take hold. And we almost lost him. Chase could barely sit unassisted when he left the hospital in late 2012 at the age of three, within a week of restarting uh, his infusion. He's a true testament to what early treatment can do to delay disease. Once it takes hold, it's nearly impossible to recover the things you've lost. Now his bedroom was better equipped than most hospital rooms. We had a pulse ox, BiPAP, cough assist, oxygen concentrator, every conceivable uh, wheelchair, play chair, stander, feeding pumps, adjustable bed. And he had every sensory toy, every specialist at his disposal. And he had everything except the freedom to move or to speak. During the course of his seven years, he had to have operations for hip dysplasia and more full leg casts. He was fed via a tube. Uh, towards the end of his life in the last few months, his med list contained 17 different medicines, compounds, or therapies. Uh, <clears throat> his life was a series of medicine doses, physical therapy, and naps. He survived on painkillers around the clock to help with neuropathy and dystonia. His seizures were not a large part of his course, and we were able to keep his seizure meds at a stable dose for uh, years using a compounded oil. Uh, through it all, we think he was happy. He laughed often, and he absolutely lit up when his brother spent time with him. Uh, we outfitted an RV with a hospital room so he could travel around and make some friends. Um, but Neiman Pixie took more than just my son Chase's childhood. It forced his brother to sacrifice his as well. He knew when he wasn't shy about telling ER staff that you need a three-quarter inch needle to access his brother's port or that vancomycin is an antibiotic not to be given. So my sur surviving son and I have uh, PTSD. We don't sleep well. We sometimes hear the pulse ox in the middle of the night still. And we're learning uh, what it means to live without him to care for. Now, Chase's life was one medical procedure after another, but he never complained. He met every day with a huge smile for all of us, and he was an incredible little boy. And I'm so proud to be Chase's mom, and I'm so proud to share a little bit about his journey with all of you. And I uh, thank you all for listening. Appreciate it. My name is Deanna O'Day from Omaha, Nebraska, and I stand before you representing my son on behalf of my husband and I. Osama is our only child. The meaning of his name is Lion, and he has shown us his true strength. My husband and I were married in 2015, and we found out a few months later that we were expecting. This was the happiest time in our life, and we prayed for a happy and healthy baby. Through a high-risk pregnancy, and with the best doctors by our side, our son was born at 32 weeks, and he came out fighting. He was born with an enlarged liver, enlarged spleen, and diagnosed with hyperbilirubin anemia. He spent his first two months of life fighting to get off oxygen and feeding tube in the NICU. On June 13th, he was finally sent home with no answers as to why he had an enlarged liver and spleen. With Osama being a preemie, we were warned that he may be behind developmentally, and after being home, we found that he had low muscle tone and wasn't able to roll over or sit, and that he was not hitting his milestones. This is when PT first entered his life. And with me being a stay-at-home mom, I was able to focus on his therapies at home. Osama was 13 months old when he lost the ability to stand using a table. We shared this with his doctor, and that is when it was decided a full genetic panel would need to be run. 
Eight weeks later, on August 31st, we got the call that no parent wants to receive. Neiman Pick Type C was the outcome of the genetic panel, and from there we began searching for answers. Fatal, progressive, and no known cure, those were all over the information about MPC. We knew we couldn't stand by and continue to watch our son lose all of his abilities. We began an experimental treatment in February 2018 and added PT, OT, and speech to the list of his weekly therapies. Osama is almost three years old, and his week consists of twice weekly sessions of PT, OT, and speech. This is not the life we imagined for our boy, and even though he is tough and goes along with his schedule, some days he just wants to play and laugh and have fun with his cousins. NPC has held Osama back in many areas. With his speech delays, he's had a difficult time playing with other children because they cannot understand him. Watching his frustration is heartbreaking. He is currently on a walker due to his poor gait. Sometimes kids are interested why he's on a walker and um, sometimes they just keep clear of him. I do worry how this will affect him later in life. Osama is unable to play outdoors independently. The park is one of the hardest places for him because he just wants to play like the other kids. Um, but NPC gave him poor gait and low muscle tone, so he's unable to climb, go up the stairs, or cross the bridge alone. There are many tasks um, in the home that Osama requires help with, such as dressing himself, opening doors, getting toys, getting into bed, getting on the couch, going up and down stairs, um, and sitting at the table still requires a booster chair. He is in constant need of assistance, and being almost three means he wants his independence. The negative impact of Osama's symptoms affect us on a daily basis. On his best days, he is able to play and interact with other children on his own and with our help. But on his worst days, he isn't able to play with others because he can't keep up or his walker isn't allowed. And being only two, he doesn't understand why. Seeing his sweet, disappointed, and sad face just breaks my heart. His frustration comes to light when people are unable to understand him or communicate with him. And sometimes he just laughs and moves on, but as his mom, I can see the hurt on his face. This creates isolation, and having relationships is vital to a happy life. Over time, we realize that his poor balance and developmental delays are all related to NPC, and that without treatment, we would have been watching our son slowly fade away from us. Symptoms since starting treatment have not progressed, and his speech, gross, and fine motor skills have all greatly improved. We are so thankful to have this treatment. While it may not be a cure, it is giving him a fighting chance. Our biggest concern and fear is to lose our boy. Second to that is for him to lose himself to NPC, to lose his ability to walk, talk, eat, and eventually breathe on his own. His laughter and love for life keeps him and all of us going on a daily basis, and we will do everything in our power to help him continue to receive treatment and have the best life possible. Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Gail Kujayan, and I live in Illinois. I am the mother of Alec and Haley, who have NPCs. And Alec is 20, and my daughter Haley is 19. I appreciate the opportunity to be on this panel to share my experience with the NPC community and the FDA. My kids are on different ends of the NPC spectrum. My daughter Haley, who was diagnosed at age 13, has many of the symptoms that you've already heard from from other parents, such as seizures, cognitive issues, requires 24-7 care. My son, who was diagnosed later when our family was tested following Haley, has been fortunate enough to have started treatment at an early stage. Alec does not have many of the symptoms that Haley does, but my husband Harry and I worry about them both equally. We worry about the uncertainty of what the future holds for our kids. The fact is that we have treatments, but not a cure. There is progression and damage done to the body every day. Eventually, the, the disease will catch up. So like many families, we spend time researching for potential treatments that would ultimately lead for a cure. We do a lot of fundraising to support the researchers. We will tell our story to the media, medical community, and basically to anybody that will listen. 
This is our new normal. We do our best to make things as normal as possible. We give our kids as many opportunities as possible. There are things that we can't do any longer. Haley used to be able to run and swim. That is no longer possible. Because of her cognitive decline and seizure, Haley will not be able to go to college, drive a car like her friends, or get married. However, no matter what the struggles are, I am grateful for what we have, a beautiful family. So without any further delay, here is my son, Alec. <laughs> Hello. It's okay. Hello. My name is Alec Kujain. I will be 21 in three months, a big milestone for me. I work four to five days a week at a store called Menards, which is like Home Depot. I work from five in the morning to 10 in the morning. Before that, I worked at a warehouse at Siemens where my dad works, and before that, I was a camp counselor at our local park district for two years. I drive a car and I go to, to the, 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 the I, I go to the local community college. I will be graduating this May with my associate's degree in fire science in a couple of months. I'm hoping I will become a firefighter. Oh, I also have MPC. I didn't have many any symptoms when I was growing up. My sister Haley did, though, from seizures to learning issues. The only reason why I was diagnosed so early was because of my sister. When Haley was diagnosed, the whole family got tested. I tested positive. I really didn't understand what that really meant, and... I know my parents were very worried then and still are now. I don't have many symptoms. Don't get me wrong. There are some areas I struggle with, which you will hear about shortly. And I do have to work harder to get to where I need to be. But I am willing to do it. I have been getting lumbar puncture treatments since the beginning, just like my sister Haley, which is over five years. Cheers, Dr. Kravis! <laughs> Just, just two days ago, I had my, my 138th infusion. These treatments are part of my new normal now. So what does my day look like? I wake up around 4.15 in the morning and get ready to go to work, which is at 5 a.m. I work till 10 a.m. Afterwards, I either do errands that my parents want me, want me to do, like shopping or go home to do homework or go to school for my classes. I try to help out as much as I can around the house and take care of my sister Haley too. I volunteer at Haley's Special Olympics practice every Tuesday and help with her other events. I consider myself lucky. Lucky that I was diagnosed early and started treatment early. I certainly do not want to lose the, the, the skills and opportunities that I currently have. However, it doesn't mean that everything is okay. There are certain things that I struggle with. Speech is one example. Sometimes I have problems with finding <laughs> with finding the, the right words to say. Other times I stutter, especially when I start talking fast. For example, I always get stuck at the word the and the word after. Sometimes I repeat the same word twice. You may have noticed these during my talk today. I started seeing a speech therapist to help me with these difficulties. There are speech sheets that I have that I practice almost daily to help me with my speech. At school, there are certain areas I struggle with, which means that I, am, I must study harder. As part of the Access and Disability Services, there are resources that are available to me at school that I, t that I take advantage of whenever I can. I also wear hearing aids because of mild hearing loss, so I always make sure I am sitting in front of class to hear th the, the instructors better. I do hate changing th 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 those pesky batteries, though. Finally, I just want you to know that many people do not know that I have MPC. Not my friends, not my coworkers or teachers. Mostly because I do not want their pity or get pref pre 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 preferential treatment. But I thought I thought th this this meeting was important enough for me to go public and come here and tell you my story. for the bravery in sharing all this. And that applies to all of our panelists to step forward. And it, it, it's a wonderful demonstration of how you're willing to contribute to the improvements for others. So thank you.